and verse 26. Much of this will be familiar, I trust, from our New Testament reading, but we will hear Luke's account of these things. Let us set our attention now once again on the reading of God's holy word. These are God's words. Let us hear them in that way. Luke 23, 26. And as they led him away, meaning Jesus, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them deriding, derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. And we'll end the reading there. Let us pray for God's blessing on the preaching. Our holy God, the Apostle Paul preached in such a manner in which the people perceived Christ as though crucified among them. And it is our prayer, O God, that as this minister preaches, one far less than the Apostle Paul, that the same Spirit that filled the Apostles' preaching would fill the preaching of the Word now. We pray, O Lord, that you would bless this preaching of the Word by the Holy Ghost's power, and that those who will hear the Word of God may perceive Jesus Christ and Him crucified among them, especially those who are going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And for those who do not know Christ, may He be powerfully present to their mind and heart, that they would flee to him and take our crucified and risen Savior. And so as we hear the word of God, Father, trusting in the Spirit's power, we pray that we would behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with the Lord's Supper now set and before us, we must prepare, even now, in this preaching, not just in the week that came before us, we must prepare even now to come to it by affectionately meditating on the Lord's suffering and the Lord's death. Such that when the bread is broken and the wine is poured into the chalice, we might partake of those emblems of His suffering with faith, hope, and love. 
for our Lord Jesus Christ. That by the word of God that we hear now, the Spirit would renew our minds and open our hearts to truly and really commune with Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit's operation in the sacrament. And so for our communion sermon, our action sermon, we consider the first saying of our Savior on the cross. As you might know, our Savior said seven words. He had seven sayings from the time of his crucifixion until the time of his death. The first is here in our text. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second, and we actually read it as well. Verily I say unto thee, today, he said to the thief, uh, thou shalt be with me in paradise. The third, when he said to his mother, woman, behold thy son, and to his disciple, behold thy mother. Fourth, and perhaps then the center of all the sayings, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Fifth, I thirst. Sixth, it is finished. And seventh, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. All seven sayings of our Lord Jesus Christ have great spiritual meaning. And taken together, they teach us greatly of the sufferings of Christ for our salvation and how complete a salvation that he has won for us by his own work, his own travail. And when put together, they teach much concerning the heart of God as in this, on display in Christ on the tree. The heart of God for us sinners. And it is uh, these seven sayings then, as we think on our texts that we have even read thus far, they come alongside man's depravity, don't they, friends? which requires us to have a great Savior, one who will forgive even the chief of sinners, even one who would crucify him. And so today, before we partake of Christ crucified, let us affectionately meditate on this first word on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God willing, we'll do it under three meditations. First is the setting Second is the substitution. And third is the supplication. And so our first meditation is the setting. We must consider the setting in which our Savior uttered these words on the cross, these first words. For in contrast to the brutality and the horror of the scene that is set before us, what is it that shines forth as a contrast? The mercy of the merciful and propitious heart of our Savior on the cross. This is your Savior, child of God, that you see before you. These words, as he was lifted up on his cross and fastened in place to it, beckons every sinner, even the chief, to come to him for rest and for forgiveness as he said in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. And whenever our text is read, whenever our text is preached of a truth, he draws all men to himself. He draws sinners to himself. He draws the unconverted, have faith in me. He draws the converted to replenish their faith and hope and love in him especially as these words are given meaning, richer meaning, at the table of the Lord. His very first words, think on it, friends, words of forgiveness. They proclaim that no matter how grievous your sin, all can be forgiven in him. Even those who crucify him may come to God through him for forgiveness. And as you see the heart of of the Savior, you who are contrite, you who are brokenhearted over sin, you find your warrant to come to the supper by your faith in a Redeemer who is desirous to forgive you. And as we consider now the setting with those words before us, remember what preceded verse 34 to really see the astonishing heart of the Savior 
You contrast here the cruelty and the barbarism of sinful men who crucify the Lord of glory. In our New Testament reading in Mark 15, we read that before this, the Jews cried out, crucify him, let his blood be on us and our children. Then Pilate's men scourge him. They plow his back and they strip him bare and twisted on his glorious brow a a crown of thorns. They mock him. They spit at him and they smote him. His precious head beaten by cruel sinners. And finally, they crucified him in verse 33. And when they uh, were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. They nailed him to the cross, boys and girls. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and one on the left. They nail him to the cross and they purposefully set him between two of the worst men on the earth. Two great malefactors. Why? To showcase him to uh, mock him and to set him before all the earth as the chiefest of criminals. To put the Savior between two of the worst, saying he is worse than them. He is the chief of criminals. Though he had committed, of course, no crime, Pilate said, what? I find no fault in him. And more certainly than Pilate's words, you know from the testimony of God in the Holy Scripture that our Savior had committed no sin at all. What had he only done? He'd only loved God and he had loved his neighbor. That was all he had done in his life on the earth, right? What had he done? He had preached, he had healed, he had blessed and he had shown love and grace to sinful men and women all through his three years of ministry. But in return... For his love, enmity. Psalm 109 verse 4. For my love, they are my adversaries. What a solemn thing that is. So after all this then, right? And you think of him crucified. Now he is considered as the chiefest of criminals. And though he had done no wrong, the sinner might wonder at this. What would the first words of the Savior on the cross be after this cruel treatment? Would he cry out for mercy for himself? It's too much for me. Would he hurl imprecations at his murderers? Would he call for a legion of angels to eradicate them? No. What comes next? His response in verse 34, the first words of the cross. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, the word, such a small word, but an important one. The word then. It grammatically connects the action of him being crucified to his response. Not as though there was some time that went away and then he, he said this, but it connects in the mind of God to you that his response to being crucified is, uh, are these words. But also the particle in the Greek language translated then is actually contextually better uh, translated into English as but. But. And so what God wants you to see is not just connective tissue here uh, in terms of time, but instead he wants you to see cause and effect. It sets in contrast what is in the heart and mind of sinful man, of evil man, and the pure heart of our Savior. That in response to all the barbarism, the gouging of his flesh, the tearing of his beard, the mocking, the spitting, the crucifixion, being hoisted and uh, uh, mocked as the worst of all criminals, our Lord did not revile in turn, but prayed for the forgiveness of those who would brutalize him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Beloved, these words... They are an open window, so to speak, for you into the very heart of your Savior. Because the first response of a person to cruelty is really revelatory of what is in their heart, isn't it? You think of your own response to any sort of cruelty to you, and you can understand that out of the heart your mouth will speak. And so as you take in these first words of our Savior when he hung on his cross, what does faith see? but the purity, perfection, and pity of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you also, 
further see a contrast between the light in Christ and the darkness of sinners, not just before his words came out, but maybe even more so after his words, right? Look at their response to his words in verse 34 and following. What do they do when he prays aloud, Father, forgive them? And they parted his raiment, his clothing, and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. He prayed that they would have mercy. In response, they part his clothing. They deride him. They mock him. They mock his salvation that he had come to purchase. They mock his prayer of forgiveness as well. And most stunningly, perhaps, were the contemptuous words of the rulers and the soldiers. The rulers of the Jews said, He saved others. Let him save himself. And the soldiers said, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. How they misunderstood the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ and how they despised his grace, beloved. What was the purpose in his heart? What, did he come to save himself? No, in fact, when he goes to the cross, he purposes not to save himself. He refused to save himself. And that was his own decision. And instead of giving glory to God for it, sinners mock him for his resolve to pay and drink the cup of God's wrath to the very bitter dregs. When arrested, he had told Peter, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Now he went to the cross willingly so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Why? So that he would save an innumerable multitude of sinners, even many of you here even for many, as we'll find out, who were present that mocked, derided, and crucified him. The only way, mark this well, child of God, that you and I can be saved is that if he did not save himself. He had to become sin for sinners to save sinners. He is to suffer as their substitute to the death. He had to drink every drop of God's wrath that his elect deserve. But you need to see what is in the heart of sinners and why sinners need a savior. Mockery and contempt for Christ's mercy and grace. Now, if you're an unbeliever here, you might be astonished and you maybe even be upset that I would say that you have nothing but mockery and contempt for Christ. And if you were there, you would mock him and you would curse him yourself. And you might say, I certainly would not have done anything like these men. Uh, were I before Christ crucified? Really? Do you think so, friend? Well, let me ask you this then. How do you respond to Christ's prayer of forgiveness today? How do you respond to the man who prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Would you say, yes, Lord, forgive me of all my trespasses and my sins. I believe that this is Christ, the Son of God, come to save sinners, even myself. Do you say that? Do you believe that? If not, friends, you are just like those here. You mock him. You mock him. You deride him. You blaspheme him as the son of God. You deride his suffering. You despise his gracious heart. You call him a fool. And you call him a liar on the tree. The only way for anyone here to not mock him is to take him. Is to take him. You need to take him now. You need to take him as your savior. You need to take him as your Lord. You need to repent of your sin. You need to place your faith in him, friend. You need to trust him. You need to receive him. And you need to take him for all salvation. Then, and only then, you will not be guilty of mocking and despising the precious lamb of God. And as I've said, you don't just take him as your savior. You take him as your Lord. Do not despise the banner that was hung on that cross, the sign that proclaimed him king. And you are to say, yes, here is the king, the sweet king of my heart. 
A king that forgives even those who have committed the sin of regicide against himself. Right, Boys and girls, regicide is the murder of a king. And here is the king who is ready to forgive even those who would kill the king. What a king it is who is the, 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 the Christian's king over the heart. And if you do take him, you will know that when he hung as a criminal, he hung in your place. All the crimes that you are guilty of before God, he has forgiven as he was punished in your place. This is why uh, the Lord extends mercy. This is to take his substitutionary work on the cross. Christ on the cross, numbered for, uh, with the transgressors as one of us to save transgressors. You know, his first words on the cross show us the fulfillment of Isaiah fifty three twelve, And he was numbered with who? The transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. You know, that great prophecy, which was foretelling that the sinless Lamb of God would be numbered with transgressors as the transgressor, in a sense, the chief of sinners to bear their sins. Uh, Mark 15, 28, we read it, explicitly said that Isaiah 53, 12 was fulfilled on the cross, that he was numbered with the transgressors. However, the next part of that verse is fulfilled here in Luke 23 and this account, isn't it? Where he said that he would make intercession for the transgressors. Not just be numbered with them, but also intercede for the transgressors. Being humiliated as a transgressor, bearing the sins of transgressors, yet still pleading for them and interceding for them. Father, forgive them making intercession for them on the tree. And so as we think on this prophecy fulfilled, we see that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. And we can trust that in him, who else can we trust has fulfilled Isaiah 53? No one. And so we see here that he did intercede for the transgressors even as he was numbered uh, with them. And that prophecy and that thought of being numbered with transgressors leads to our second meditation, which is the substitution. And as you think on his first words pointing to him as your substitute, beloved, you remember the nature of Christ, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ is very God and very man. Yet one person, he is one Christ. His divine person, as we are fond of remembering, took on our human nature, and yet that human nature is without sin in the incarnation. Now, as we investigate his first words on the cross, we note something which passes us by often. There's something odd about them at first, right? Uh, for those of you who have studied the Gospels, you find here a prayer to his father for forgiveness. And yet in our regular series in Luke, thus far, do you remember the controversy that the Pharisees had with Jesus when he forgave sinners directly? Do you remember how he told the paralytic in Luke 5, verse 20, thy sins are forgiven thee. He directly forgave the paralytic, right, which infuriated his enemies. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? They're right. Only God can forgive sins. And so we see that in Luke 5, right, Christ is asserting his divine, divine prerogative as God to forgive sins. Directly so, he can forgive sins as God. Yet here on the cross is something very different. Does he declare forgiveness as God? No. Instead, he prays to his Father. Why? Because on the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ willingly laid aside every divine prerogative. Why? So that he could suffer entirely as true man. To be our perfect substitute in our own nature. He would suffer entirely and totally in the human nature. Where the divine nature comes in is to uphold his humanity from utter collapse from the power and wrath of God for an innumerable multitude of sinners. This is a wrath that no mere man could endure, but there was no consolation even in that for our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's really, maybe the illustration is Aaron and her holding up Moses' hands, 
But there's no consolation for our Lord Jesus Christ in that. He must suffer entirely and totally as man. His human soul on the cross received the fullness of the power of God's bur- uh, uh, wrath against him. Consider Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, here's his humility, humiliation. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. On the cross, it is his humanity that is meant to shine forth. The weakness of the human nature. He is not going to do anything on the cross as God. And so it was at the apex of his humiliation on the cross, he would as man pray that those who deride him, those who wound him, would be forgiven. Not laying hold of his right as God to forgive directly. But we remember why this is the case, even as I have said. It is so that he may be your perfect substitute there. You have no, none of God's power. And so he must suffer entirely as man on the tree, and he must accomplish all righteousness as man there. You and I are not divine, and we never will be. We are just men, male and female both, and we need a Savior who would suffer for us as man, a Savior who would suffer on the cross as a man, uh, that the well-deserved wrath that we have earned would come on his person. But here's the next part that we need as we think on this prayer, is that we also need a Savior who lived the perfect and righteous life, one that we could never live. And on the cross, he doesn't take his rights as God so that he may win a perfect righteousness for us as well, right? These first words show us that we behold him as the Lord, our righteousness. In a way, his first words on the cross are part of his dying gift to you who believe. Part and parcel of his righteousness that he earned for sinners who receive him. You know, this cup that is before us, the Bible, or Jesus says directly in the Bible, that this represents the New Testament In his blood, his last will and testament is what that is. It not only contains the price to buy your sin debt, but it also bequeaths to you the treasury of his perfect righteousness to you as well. Pilate had said earlier, behold, the man, as we've considered in prior communion uh, sermons. And what we behold is the one perfect and righteous man in these first words on the cross who does what we would not do. Behold, then, beloved, the perfect man who loves his enemies and prays for them. Behold, the perfect man who is no hypocrite, who asks for their forgiveness. Behold, the perfect man who practiced what he preached. What did he once preach to you, beloved, this law? But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 44 through 45. What you behold on the cross is the man who loved his enemies, who blessed them, who cursed him, who did good to them that hated him and prayed for them, which despitefully used him and persecuted him. You behold the man who is the true child of our Father which art in heaven. Let me ask you this, child of God. Right? Do you fail to bless them that curse you, to do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you? And you ask then, don't you, as you struggle, and I do too, how then, according to Matthew 5, 45, may I be a child of my Father which art in heaven? Would the Savior's own words not condemn me because I am not prone in the heart to do these things? Yes, the Savior's words on that Sermon on the Mount would condemn us all. And so as we think on that, would you, child of God, lift your eyes up And consider Jesus Christ, Son of God, your righteousness lifted up on the cross. 
Even as that bread is broken before you and the wine is poured out, would you behold Christ, your righteousness, broken for you? He did not just, the Bible say, says, bleed for your sins to wash them all away. But on the very day you believed, he gave you his own perfect righteousness, the thing that you never could have in yourself. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Why is Christ made up to be the chiefest of criminals? For the chief of sinners. Why? So that you, the chiefest of sinners, might have his perfect righteousness. Not just your sins washed away, which we praise God for, but that you might have his perfection imputed to you as well. And you might ask if these things are glorious to you now. How can you have this one thing I lack and yet so desperately need? And may you and I both praise God for the simplicity and the ease in which Christ has made this available to you, to the worst of men and women. It is by faith alone, Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, the apostle says, meaning Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, his sixth word on the cross, it is finished, testifies not only of his atoning for your sin, but also that he has won a perfect righteousness for you, child of God. And he has obeyed every precept of God that we fail at. Even the ones that you struggle with today, child of God, believer, everything that you struggle with, your Savior has given his own perfection, his own righteousness to be counted as yours. This is the wonder and the awe of being a true Christian who is born again with faith in Christ. All my sins washed away, taken away from me as far as east is from west, and all the righteousness that I lack is given to cover my sinfulness as that wedding garment, Christ robing me with his own righteousness. And if you want to see how glorious and spotless this righteousness is, I want you to see how far it even excelled Stephen's, right? That first martyr of the church. And you recall that, you know, we often link these texts together, right? Stephen responded similarly when he was being martyred. But you see that Stephen needed Christ's perfection. In Acts 7, as he was being martyred, we read, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, This is Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That it means he died. What's the order in Stephen's uh, martyrdom? First, he prays for his own soul. And then second, he prays for the souls of those who murder him. But in the Lord Jesus, that was reversed, wasn't it? He first prays for his murderer. And it won't be until the very last, his seventh saying, where he commits his own soul to God. Why do I point that out? And why have better men than me pointed that out? This is the utter perfection of the righteousness that you possess by faith in Christ, completely unassailable, completely impregnable. Uh, Why we see then in Christ how this word is fulfilled. Who shall lay any charge, anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. How can any accusation stick to the one who has the very righteousness of Jesus Christ credited to them? And when the accusation of the devil comes against your sin and how you are not good enough for God, child of God, you remember then the first words of our Savior and you say, not only has he forgiven me of every trespass, but he has given me his impeccable righteousness as my own for my justification. And you say, oh, my soul, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And so now having seen his substitutionary work as sin bearer and our righteousness, let us lastly consider the supplication. And so his first words on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. And this is significant for he shows at the very first our greatest need. 
which is to be forgiven for our sins, to be forgiven of our treason to God, for the breach of all of our commandment, of his commandments, as we confessed even in our opening prayer this morning. We are all transgressors of God's law, friends, and our greatest need is forgiveness. And so we praise God, don't we, as we see and we apprehend by faith uh, in the word of God this great need that every man, woman, and child has. We praise God that this is precisely what is immediately in the heart of the Lord on the cross. It's his first thought. And so that settles your soul, beloved, to know that in his mind and in his heart was his great work, which is to procure forgiveness for you and for me. If you ache for forgiveness and you wonder, is the Lord reluctant in forgiving a sinner such as myself? He wants you to see the first word on the cross. It was first in my mind as your mediator on the cross. Forgive them. Before you have ever sought out forgiveness from me, I have had it in my own heart towards you. And so you need to be settled at the table, sinner. Your forgiveness was no afterthought to the Lord. Even before he thinks on his own spirit and commending it, right again, we remember the reversed order from Stephen. He is thinking of forgiving his people. It is present in his heart. It was his heart's disposition that even in misery, he remembers mercy. It's his first words. And not only does the Savior pray for our forgiveness, he also gives a reason for They know not what they do. Now, the astonishment of this word uh, really does show how far our forgiveness or his forgiveness reaches. Consider what it is. What is it that they did not know that they had done? And I think that when you meditate on that question, you are astonished by how far the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ goes and the Father's forgiveness as well. It was not that they were ignorant that they had crucified a righteous man. No, their ignorance was that they did not know that they had crucified God in the flesh. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8, for had they known it, this is the critical phrase, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is ultimately more than uh, any lack of knowledge of crucifying a man who was innocent is really what's at the core of our Savior's prayer. They crucified God. They knew not what they had done in that. That they had crucified God incarnate. Because Christ's divine person, He is the Son of God, counts His humanity as Himself. And so to crucify His manhood is to crucify God. Now, what greater... What more heinous sin can you imagine of than that child of God? Is there a greater sin that man could possibly commit? No, there isn't. Jesus knew full well when he prays for their forgiveness who he is, God in the flesh. And he knows full well what these had done. Yet he prayed that even these would be forgiven of even this greatest and most terrible sin of all. So does this prayer, these first words, beloved, not show you how far his intercession will go? What lesser sin do you fear he has not forgiven of yours? We had read in Zechariah 12.10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look on who? Upon me, whom they have pierced. This is God speaking. They will look on me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. When your heart is open to know the truth that you have crucified Christ and I too, not just the men who were there uh, that day, but everyone who believes has crucified Christ because our sins have pierced him with many sorrows. We mourn. Why? Because we have crucified the Lord of glory. And our soul finds bitterness in that thought. How can we possibly, we ask then, as we mourn, be forgiven of this this greatest and most heinous sin? I have injured 
the adorable spotless Lamb of God, God's own fellow, God's own Son. And you might be tempted to say, surely there is no forgiveness for me. But isn't there? Isn't there when you hear the first words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sinner, can you doubt that the Savior has a heart to forgive you? When he is willing to forgive both regicide and deicide, that is, boys and girls, the attempt to kill God, seeking to murder God, how can you believe that he will not forgive any other sin of yours? At the table, then, you find the word of forgiveness for every sin. Not just one sin, not just little sins, but the most heinous sins of all. For what sin can compare to crucifying the Lord of glory? And these words then preach the fullness of the forgiveness that he has bought for you, child of God. And they also show you, praise be to God for this, that he also forgives sins that you are still ignorant of. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that teaches, first of all, that sinning out of ignorance, uh, ignorance of God's law is still sin. You need to be forgiven for that. And Christ does forgive in his people sins of ignorance. Uh, it does not give you and me a pass. It needs forgiveness. And that one thought, as we consider this Bible before us, with all the ways that we can sin before God, can torment you, child of God. That I sin, even today, in ways that I am ignorant of still. The more, and I'll just say this as a personal note, the more I dive into God's word every day, the more sins I find in my heart that are being revealed to me. And there are sins you and I will still discover until the day that we die, and we will die in ignorance too of things that we have done against the glory of God. And that's not God's fault. His word is very clear on our duties. It's the stupidity of my mind and the hardness of my heart that refuses to examine itself according to the word. But David prayed, didn't he, in Psalm 1912, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And here you find how David's prayer is answered. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you find that even those sins we commit in ignorance, our Lord Jesus Christ is willing to save. And you find that my transgressions are more than I can possibly imagine, but my Savior's grace and mercy and work is far greater than I can think of as well. The Old Testament showed you this, that sins of ignorance could be atoned for solemnly by a sacrifice made by fire, Numbers 15.25. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. Christ is the fulfillment of that word, interceding for us. And when he gives his fourth word on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fire of God's wrath burned his soul as in Numbers 15.25 so that we could be forgiven of even the things that we are not even privy to because of our hardness of heart. In all these things then, as you consider both the greatness of the sins that can be forgiven you and also even the things that you are ignorant of that are forgiven by the Lord, do you see the utter completeness of the work of Jesus Christ? When you come to this table by faith, beloved, you come knowing that Jesus has atoned for all you have done and all you will ever do. You come understanding then the totality of the scripture which says there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. How can there be with such a total Savior as this? How can you doubt it, beloved, when there is forgiveness for even the sin of crucifying God? When there is forgiveness for the sins you commit in ignorance? And when Christ's unassailable perfection is yours? How is it possible you could ever be condemned? When you look on the bread and wine, will you glory in those emblems or will you come to praise God in thankfulness for this Christ? And for your encouragement as well, lest you don't know this, 
When the son pleads, the father answers. Jesus said in John 14, 11, 42, of the father that he hearest me always. There's no doubt that the father answered this prayer of our savior. And indeed, Jesus' prayer was answered, and that gives you an assurance of your own forgiveness and salvation. Right then and there, the centurion, which said, truly this man was the son of God, believed on him. But more dramatically and more significantly, when Peter preached at Pentecost, and 3,000 at least were converted. Listen to Acts 3, verses 13 through 17. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. Listen to their culpability in crucifying the Lord of glory. When he was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed whom? The Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And listen to this. And now, brethren, I wot that thou, uh, that through ignorance ye did it. That through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. What did Peter preach? You killed the prince of life. You killed the Lord of glory, but you did it through what? Ignorance. What did Jesus pray? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so here is our link to the first saying on the cross. Beloved, let me put it this way. Why were 3,000 converted? It is because Jesus had prayed for them. Not because Peter preached a mighty fine sermon, that's an instrumental cause, sure, but the efficacy of his preaching was sourced in that Jesus had prayed for them and that the Father hears him always, showing you, right, that Jesus' prayer of forgiveness is never in vain. And the Father was pleased with Christ's sacrifice and prayers. And therein is something sublime for you, child of God, the believer. Why are you saved? Why are you converted? Is it not because Jesus has prayed for you and you specifically? Even for Peter, who did the preaching that day, did Christ not have to pray for him first? Just a chapter before our text in Luke 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. If you're converted, beloved, it is because Christ has prayed for you. And if he has prayed for you, he will never cease praying for you, that thy faith fail not. But Christ's prayer of forgiveness also required satisfaction for the Father to forgive. As Hebrews 9.22 says, without shedding of blood is no remission, is no forgiveness. So he has to pray, but he also has to purchase, which he did on the cross. And what do we see at the table? That he who prayed for forgiveness also purchased it with his own body and his own blood. And as you look on the emblems of the t- uh, at the table, you see the price paid to fulfill the first word of the cross. You see that the forgiveness of your sin is very costly, and its cost is the life of the prince of life. Psalm 9, uh, 49, 8, for the redemption of their soul is precious. So precious it requires the death of he who is altogether lovely, he who is most precious, the death of the Son of God. And when he prayed, Father, forgive them, do you think he was unaware of the cost? No, he was fully aware, which is why he wouldn't save himself, which is why he wouldn't call for the legions of angels to come and tear him off of that cross. He, out of love for you, his people, You who believe, resolve to stay there and pay every bit of the wrath that you deserve. And so at the table, you see then the satisfaction 
of the first words of the cross. When the bread is broken, see the satisfaction for Father, forgive them. When the wine is poured into the cup, you see the the satisfaction of Father, forgive them. And if this word here then does not testify how earnest he is for your salvation believer, what possibly could? Believer, you are to partake of these emblems, knowing these elements, knowing what he prayed for is yours. It's yours. Why? Because he prayed for you and he purchased you then and there. And that is all proclaimed in the death of Christ that we will celebrate. And now, raised from the dead on the third day, raised up into the heavens, alive forevermore, seated at God's right hand as our great high priest. He makes intercession for us still. He pleads the same blood that he uh, shed at Calvary each and every day and even in the supper now. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, how would he ever stop pleading for his people? He won't. The same heart that brought about, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do on the cross, is the same heart that sits at God's right hand even now for you, believer. May God give you the faith to believe it, and may God bless his word to us. Let us arise to prayer now. O Lord of heaven, To imagine that sinners like us can have forgiveness for crucifying the Lord of glory. We say it is too much, O Lord, to know that we can be forgiven even that. It's too much to know that we who struggle with loving even our enemies can have the perfect righteousness of Christ, who prayed even for us, his enemies, And yet, Father, we see the love of God in these things. And yet our hearts are so slow to believe. And they're so slow to give praise to God for such wonderful things as he hath done for us. Forgive us even this sin that we are often so ignorant of. uh, The need to be thankful for what you have done for us in Christ. May the Spirit apply the preaching of the word to our hearts now that we would give glory to God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated for a moment.